in many prestigious institutions in United Kingdom, in United States of America, and in Israel. Uh, he has also been a visiting professor at Institute of Law, Nirma University. Um, he has written many wonderful books uh, on uh, peace negotiations between Israel and Palestine. Uh, here he is going to uh, deliver a lecture on his recent wonderful uh, book uh, on just reasonable multiculturalism, liberalism, culture, and coercion. So we are extremely delighted to have you here, Professor uh, Almagor. Uh, I'll hand over the mic to you uh, to present your talk on this wonderful book that you have written this year. So over to you, Professor Almagor. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm delighted to be back at NEMA, although virtually, but I have uh, fond memories from, from NEMA and I am uh, uh, happy to, to be part of your project. I think it's a, it's a wonderful project. You should be congratulated and should continue. I think it's your second year that you do such an event. Um, I participated also in your last event and uh, enjoyed it very much. So thank you very, very much for this kind of invitation. Um, so in this talk, I would like to present you my new book and uh, the theory of just reasonable multiculturalism. You can see the cover of the book. And um, I've been researching multiculturalism for many, many years. I started my journey on multiculturalism in the 1990s. And um, usually there are three attacks on, on, on multiculturalism. Um, so the first attack, major attack that has been for a while is that multiculturalism is bad for democracy. Multiculturalism is bad for democracy and because in a democracy, in liberal democracy, everything stems from the individual and everything returns to an individual. The individual is in the center of attention. Whereas when you're talking about group rights and multiculturalism is group rights, then it might be the case that group rights are going to trump individual rights. So the group is going to override the individual. And therefore they claim the argument against multiculturalism, the attack is that multiculturalism is bad for democracy. The second attack on multiculturalism is that it is bad for women. It is bad for women because oftentimes when you have cultural groups who want to secure the group against external interferences, usually women are subjected to some sort of abuse. So the security is to continue the abuse of women. And if you think about all kinds of cultural ritual around the globe, starting from female infanticide, usually or almost, it's only girls and female circumcision and female genital mutilation and sati and murder for family honor and so on, denying education, denying work, uh, jobs for women and so on women have to pay a very high price. So feminists uh, came against multiculturalism and said, why do you want to protect multiculturalism? At the end, who is going to suffer as a result of that? Women are going to suffer. So that's the second attack. The most recent attack came from David Cameron, who said no less that multiculturalism is conducive to political extremism, to radicalization, and in turn to terrorism. Now this attack, uh, which I thought was utterly unfounded and outrageous, to be honest about this, this is what prompted me to write this, this book. Because until I said, I, I've been around researching multiculturalism for 20 years, but this was an attack that said, okay, now I have to tackle this and to have my own say about multiculturalism, um, continue my research and, and relating to the, these three attacks and um, establish a, a theory that would be able to reconcile between multiculturalism and liberalism. Henceforth, so the, the thought came into 2011 and the book was published last year. So it was about 10 years in the making. The thesis that I presented in the book is that multiculturalism and liberal democ democracy can be reconcilable it is possible to secure what I call the golden mean, if you like, the Aristotle golden mean between liberalism and multiculturalism. This is provided that the mechanism for reconciliation are just and reasonable. So I have to say something about justice and I have to say something about the concept of what constitutes reasonableness. 
So the main questions that I posed in the book, and I answered to the best of my abilities, how are group rights related to individual rights? That's related to the first attack. What should we do if group rights come into conflict with individual rights? That's the second attack that uh, usually it's sort of a pretense to exploit and abuse women. And when should liberal democracy interfere in illiberal practices of its subcultures? This is in order to prevent all kinds of abuses of multiculturalism or abuses against women, children, infants, all vulnerable populations. So let me continue by giving you a short overview of the book. The book is uh, separated into three parts. The first part is the theoretical part. I'm a political scientist. So usually in political science, there is a theoretical foundation that underpins the entire project. And then we uh, employ the theory uh, to analyze the case studies or the issues at hand. So first I formulated a theory of just reasonable multiculturalism. In the first chapter, I explain what justice is, what liberalism is, and what democracy is. This is the first sort of leg, if you like, of my theory. The second chapter has to be about the concept of being reasonable and about multiculturalism. So I explain this, these two notions, what do they mean, how they are defined, how they should be re um, recognized and utilized. And you understand that the first concept, reasonable, qualifies the second concept, multiculturalism. So I'm not endorsing any form of multiculturalism. I'm endorsing only the forms that I consider to be reasonable. And of course, I explain what is reasonable and what is not reasonable, at least in the liberal culture. The third leg of the theory has to, to, to do with uh, two other concepts, which I think are essential when you have differences. I'm not a proponent of wars. I'm not a proponent of violence. I'm not a proponent of settling differences through all kinds of conflicts. I'm a strong believer in compromise. So if you have notions that are conflicting, the way forward, I believe, are through the mechanism of compromise and through the mechanism of deliberate democracy. The entire theory and the entire book has to do only about democratic societies. I don't pretend to be universalist, not because I don't believe that the values that I preach and that I promote are not universal. I do believe that they're universal, but I'm also a practical person. And I do realize that the concept that I'm speaking about, they can be you know, uh, very reasonable and very just, but are going to bring very, very little tr truth in places like North Korea or Iran or other countries that are based on authoritarian regimes. They were not going to accept this. So I can speak for endlessly about women's rights, but how can I speak about women's rights in places like Iran when women today are stoned to death because they've been seen holding hands with a foreigner? So the entire theory is about democracies and mainly liberal democracy, or not, not only liberal democracy, I'll explain later. This will come in the, in, at the later stage of the book. But this is what I want to promote. I want to promote the notion of compromise as a mechanism, as a tool to reconcile differences. And I want to promote communication, deliberation. You speak about your needs, your ends, your aspirations, and I will speak uh, about mine. We are going to discuss, we are going to deliberate, and we are going to find the golden mean. The fourth aspect or the fourth leg and the last leg of the book has to do with the concept of, of coercion. Of course, we have sort of a um, knee-jerk sentiment against coercion. Nobody likes to be coerced. And uh, it's a pejorative term most of the time because we like to live our lives as free human beings. However, when you come to think about this, our life is saturated with coercion. Uh, we all pay taxes whether we want it or not. We all have to obey laws, whether we find them just or not just, but we must be obedient to law, otherwise there'll be anarchy and chaos. Uh, the vast majority of us send our kids to school, at least until the age of 16, oftentimes until the age of 18, whether we like it or not, because we value, I mean, in democracy, we value uh, education and we feel this is the key for one's success. 
So there's many, many coercive things that are around us. And of course, when you want to interfere into illiberal practices of cultures within liberal democracy, within democracy, then you must employ coercion, say to save the women or whatever, but you have to resort to coercion. There's no other way because you can speak endlessly about women rights in a, in a certain culture within liberal democracy that does not employ women's rights. Uh, communication enough is not going to be sufficient. You have to start with communication. You have to start with deliberation. You have to start by seeking compromise. But if it falls on deaf ears, then maybe there's no other way but to resort to coercion. So the fourth proponent or aspect of the book has to do with the concept of coercion. This is the theoretical part of the book. And then I apply this uh, theory to the case studies. So the application part um, first is looking for interference in minority affairs when they involve physical harm. So I generally speaking separate between physical harm and non-physical harm. Physical harm is, is tangible. It's very, um, it's clear. I mean, when I swing my hand and I punch one's nose, that person is going to bleed. There's harm, there's visible harm. That's quite easy. But uh, not all harms are visible. So uh, when we are talking about non-physical harm, they can be as serious as physical harm, at least upon, upon my perspective. And it also warrants interference of liberal democracy in the businesses of illiberal cultures within liberal democracy. So notice that I'm talking about only the framework of democracies and then the issue how the government has to relate to cultures within democracy that employ illiberal practices. And for me, the, it's a very serious question, very hard question, is the question of interference when we should do that and when we should not. So when it comes to physical harm, I'm considering easy topics. I mean, for me, I think easy and I don't think that are controversial, like murder for family honor. I think that we should not allow this per se, you know, in principle, there's no way that you can justify murder and all kinds of forms um, that involve torture in the name of tradition and honor. So uh, sati, um, female genital mutilation, this abhorrent and should not be part of democracy. So we should fight against them, um, and notwithstanding. And then I'm going to more tricky issues of male circumcision and also female circumcision. And my argument is that if there are strong reasons, historical reasons, traditional reasons, uh, religious reasons for these practices, provided they don't entail severe harm, they don't entail torture, um, and they are mitigated against, against torture, then male circumcision, also female circumcision, that can be manifested, say, for a scar on the outer labia of the women or the girl, this can be wanted, that can be justified. And of course, we have to continue the rapport, the communication, the deliberation between the government and the group regarding these practices. With regard to non-physical harm, I'm dealing with discrimination of women and of prostates. Uh, women uh, have been discriminated against, unfortunately, especially when they decided to marry outside the tribe uh, or decided to, uh, to leave their culture, leave their religion and take another religion, move to another culture. And then according to some uh, cultures, they lose everything. Even if they work in that tribe, in that uh, subcultures for 20, 30 years of their lives, uh, the culture uh, demands that you leave the tribe, you leave the community with nothing, only with the clothes on your, on your body. And I think this is unfair. Um, so I'm protesting against this and I'm speaking about security and equality for women and for everyone. Everyone deserves the same equal rights. And then um, the last chapter in this section of the book is about denying education to children. I'm a firm believer of, of education. I am a professor at university. I've dedicated all my life to educate people. And I know that it is a key for one's success. Uh, it is a key for promotion of one's autonomy, develop self-development, uh, ability to think, ability to reason. It's extremely important. And when children are denied this opportunity, I think that's can be very, very harmful. 
and detrimental to the well-being and to their health, and of course, to their ability to be autonomous human beings. And in this, uh, in this chapter, I'm taking one uh, example, and this is the Amish in the United States and in North America and Canada too, uh, where the Amish believe that uh, children should be educated until the age of 16, and then go to work with the families and their farmers to, so do, to do agricultural work, which is extremely difficult. And uh, throughout education, until the age of 16, they don't endorse the same values, the same principles, and the same curricula of the American education system. So if the children upon the age of 18, when they become adults, decide to remain in the Amish community, there's no problem. But what about those Amish who decide to leave? They will find it really difficult to integrate into the American society in which they know very little about. Although they live in the United States, you know, they're surrounded by Americans, but they're not privy to American education system. They don't know the American history. They don't know the American geography. They know hardly mathematics. They know hardly sciences. To what extent they could become integral part of America if they want to live. They can do manual jobs forever, but they're not equipped to be able to elevate in the American society. So I think this is wrong and I, uh, I speak against this. The last part of the book is about two country case studies and they are not liberal, uh, France and Israel. Uh, France adopted um, a French version of liberal democracy, which put the, the emphasis and the focus on the Republic. So it's a very centralized uh, country uh, in the name of unity of the Republic, they deny central human rights to human beings. And they have this obsession of how people dress. And I'll speak about this later. So in both France and in Israel, we find coercion uh, by the majority of the cultural minority. In Israel, it's manifested vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Israeli Palestinians or Israeli Arabs as they call themselves. So this is the general overview of the book. So I'm speaking about cases in when one is inflicting pain of, or death upon oneself. And I differentiated this between cases in which one is inflicting damage upon others. And as you can imagine, I'm far more liberal when one is inflicting pain upon oneself than when one is inflicting pain on others. So there's an example of inflicting pain on oneself. This is the issue of scarring. That in some uh, tribes in South America and in Africa, it's a sign of beauty, and it's also a sign of entering adulthood. So you are mature enough to have this and, and have done, and, and you could see uh, that's an example that considered very, very beautiful in that culture. Um, if you like, it's um, similar to tattooing in, in democracies. Uh, so I'm claiming that scarring like tattooing should be tolerable provided that the tools that are done, this, the scarring are hygienic, uh, that there won't be you know, some sort of, of uh, um, uh, disease that is going to be uh, spreading the body as a result of doing the scarring, and that it's not excessive. Ex access is, is bad, whether you do too many tattoos or you do too many scarring, uh, the body is not going to tolerate this very well, so it has to be within measure. But you know, generally speaking, I don't think that there's any issue with scarring. I'm opposing sati. You know, you, sati is something that has happened in India. I was told that is no longer with us. I'm told that it's historical phenomena and not a recent phenomena. And this is something that I'm very pleased to hear. I've done some research about sati and uh, spoke with some of you leading scholars in India about the issue of sati and they all pledged to me that sati is historical phenomena. If you know something better than me, I'll be more uh, than happy to be enlightened and to be informed uh, uh, by you on this issue of sati. I told you that I'm very much opposed for against uh, to murder for family honor. I think that this issue of controlling people and con controlling women by um, frightening them, by terrorizing them, by subjecting them to, to this uh, kind of conduct, uh, murdering them, just to preserve uh, honor and dignity of the tribe or of the family is, is just as atrocious. I, I don't think it should be, should be done. I don't think that there's any dignity in murdering. And I think it's just a euphemism that is not placed rightly. 
it's mis misplaced euphemism. So I'm very much against matter of meliona. With regard to female genital mutilation and female circumcision, um, I'm, I told you that I'm very much against torture. And for me, female genital mutilation is, is a torture. When um, the tribe decides that uh, to subject girls, young girls between the age of nine and 14 usually, uh, to this kind of practice of female genital mutilation, they cut the clitoris, uh, they cut the, the outer labia, they leave the women only with a small hole to urinate. Uh, every time that they have intercourse when they married, it's, it would be torture. That's mean torture for life because they suffer tremendously all their lives. I cannot condone this. I'm saying uh, that has to be stopped. This has to be distinguished from female circumcision um, that um, I found in some tribes when you do just a scar, a symbolic scar on the outer labia. Um, in many respects, in that respect, it is less harmful than male circumcision when they cut uh, part of the penis, which is far more painful, but male circumcision is done when uh, the children usually are babies, when they're eight days old. So luckily for us, we're able to forget this after a while. I don't know anybody who can remember his circumcision. But the point is that I'm making a distinction, and I think it's a viable and important distinction that will, be in, will enable to maintain culture, to pay homage to culture and religion, and at the same time, uh, provide some sort of security against torture to women and to girls. So I think this is a very important distinction that I'm making here. And then uh, one chapter is about male circumcision that is prevalent among the Muslim community. It's prevalent again among the Jewish community, and it's prevalent in some Christian communities, first and foremost in the United States. Uh, many Christians in the United States uh, do circumcise their children. Um, I can tell you that I agonized over this issue for many months because, uh, you know, loyal to my methodology, I was trying to find a golden mean between culture and um, the, the right of the child. And I was able, after months of deliberation and consulting many, many people, rabbinical sages, imams, uh, physicians, uh, experts on anesthetic, uh, people who perform this. After consultation with many stakeholders, um, I came uh, with, uh, with a proposal of how to do male circumcision in a just, reasonable way. It's not, uh, it's not the way that is done nowadays, oftentimes, but I hope uh, that my contribution uh, would lead to a more humane practice of male circumcision. I'm definitely not against male circumcision as such, I think just has to be improved, uh, the method has to be improved so as to uh, minimize pain to the newborns. So um, when it comes to discrimination, non-physical harm, I'm uh, looking at especially two cases, one from Canada and one from the United States. So from the States, the Santa Clara Pueblo versus Martinez, when the American Supreme Court contended with the issues of Indian autonomy and gender discrimination, and they grappled with the first attack on multiculturalism that is bad for democracy, and with the second challenge that is bad for women. And at the end, they decided that uh, the Indian tribe uh, can continue the practices of discrimination against women uh, because the autonomy of the tribe is extremely important for the United States. So it is an old case, 1978, but it's a very important precedent that still many people rely upon. I'm taking the opposite view. I'm taking the liberal view that says that we need to protect the rights of the women in this case and any other cases. And I don't think that the autonomy of the tribe is more important than the autonomy of the individual. So I oppose Santa Clara Pueblo versus Martinez precedent, and I uh, contend that the opposite should be the case. Similarly is the case Hofer versus Hofer in, the, in Canada, which dealt with the powers of the Hutterite church over its members. And here we are talking about discrimination against members who have abandoned the traditional tribal religion in the distribution of housing. So once you um, um, abandon your culture, you are not deserving any rights according to the Hutterites. 
uh, it came all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. The Canada, like in the United States, granted autonomy to, um, to the Hutterites, refused to interfere on behalf of the harmed people, and said that the autonomy of the tribe is more important than the autonomy of the individual. As is with St. Clara, I oppose this court judgment. I think it's mistaken. And I think that the autonomy of the, the autonomy of the individual is as important as the autonomy of the tribe. And my plea is that in future cases, the state should intervene to ensure that there's equality between people. Um, and this is um, chapter eight, uh, the last chapter in the second section of the book that has to do with the denial of education to children. This is uh, again, American precedent in um, American court case um, that came to the Supreme Court, Wisconsin versus Yoder, in which uh, the state of Wisconsin uh, appealed to the Supreme Court of, of the United States and said that they would like to offer American education to Amish children. And here again, uh, the United States Supreme Court stood for the autonomy of the Amish and said that the Amish uh, can administer their own education to their own children um, and uh, the children are not manifestly harmed. I did research. I researched uh, what happens to Amish who would like to leave the community. And I can tell you that the stories are agonizing oftentimes, not only agonizing in terms of what happens to them after they leave the Amish, but also what happens to them when they live with the Amish, because there's a lot of sexual abuse among the Amish community. But everything is described in that chapter. Uh, that's just one picture of the Amish community. You know that they're opposed to electricity, they're opposed to uh, modern technology, so they still use buggies. And uh, here's some example for that. Um, France is, um, especially in recent years, especially after September 11, 2001, uh, terrorism is a serious uh, issue for them. Security is a serious issue for them. And as they become more cognizant to the issue of security and the fear of terrorism, so they become uh, more, um, more stringent in their attitude about enforcing uh, republic norms over society. So what I witnessed in, in my research is that while they have this uh, motto of the Republic, Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité, but in practice, what they have is a manifestation of indivisibilité, security, and uh, laïcité, meaning um, that, the, that the Republic should not be divided and multiculturalism for them in France is uh, synonym, synonym with uh, divisiveness and they put a lot of emphasis on security because they claim that multiculturalism endangers security like David Cameron. And Le Cité is a secularism. So in the name of secularism, they say that in public, everyone should look alike. Everyone should look the same. And therefore in 2010, they instituted a law that banned the burqa and the niqab in France. I'm very much opposed to that. I think that uh, the state has no uh, claim on how women dress. It's none of their business. And to make things worse, in southern France, in some resorts down like Nice and others, they also had local laws against the Burkini. So and the Burkini is against the credo of the French Republic. Just to see how ridiculous this claim is, this is an example of a Burkini versus an example of a diving suit. You know, check the differences yourself. But certainly it's not an issue that has to do only with dress. There's something that is more sinister in this kind of attitude to uh, Muslim women in France. And in Israel, I'm uh, a proponent of equality of basic human rights. I oppose to the coercion of um, the Israeli Jews of the Israeli Palestinian. Formally, all citizens of Israel are subject to the same laws. So formally, Israeli Arab citizens are equal. But unfortunately, I show in my research uh, that there is a discrimination against Palestinians even today. And again, in the name of security, 
grappling with the continuous threat of terrorism, this uh, provides pretense for the Israeli government at times to discriminate against Arabs. And I think this is wrong. The vast majority of Israeli Arabs have no involvement in terrorism. More than 90%, 95% of the Israeli Arabs have nothing to do with terrorism. So to use this security as a pretense to discriminate against Arabs, I think it's wrong. I also highlight in my book that there's also coercion by the minority of the Israeli majority. Because as you know, Israel is the only Jewish state in the world and it continuously, continuously grappling with the idea of how to reconcile between democracy and, um, and Judaism. And of course, liberal democracy and Judaism are in essential conflict. They cannot be reconciled easily, if at all. And until today, Israel is paying homage giving preference to Judaism over liberalism. And I think this is wrong. The way that it is manifested is the fact that Jewish orthodoxy, that is a minority in Israeli society because more than 40 something percent of Israeli Jewish people are secular. They have a, a monopoly on all issues pertaining to private matters. So the issues of birth, you know, you need to be circumcised if it's a, if it's a boy, uh, marriage, divorce, and burial, all um, are uh, administered by orthodoxy. Although, as I said, uh, um, the majority of the people are not orthodox. So um, it's really painful, extremely painful when it comes to the issues of divorce, because even if you married in a civil uh, ceremony, say in the United States, there's no, there's no civil ceremony in Israel, it doesn't exist, because as I said, uh, orthodoxy has monopoly on personal matters. But say that you've been married in the United States and then you in, in, in the city council, yes, uh, civil marriage. And then after a while with three kids, you immigrated to Israel. And after a few years, it didn't work and you part ways. And to the horror of these people, they would find out that in order to divorce, they have to go to the rabbinical courts, to the orthodox uh, religious courts to do this. And unfortunately, because it's orthodoxy, orthodoxy is not very kind or not, or not always very kind to women. And after time, women have been discriminated against. So again, we find that Israel is grappling with the first, the second, and also the third challenge of security. Um, I should also mention that in Israel, our localities tend to be very, very poor in comparison to Jewish localities, and they suffer from lack of resources. That's one manifestation of uh, discrimination. Another is the issue of land. Land, of course, is extremely important, especially for the Arabs. And Arabs, Israeli Arabs own in Israel today only 2.5% of the Israeli lands. So the vast majority um, is in the hands of, of Jewish people. I recommend with regard to Israel that the symbol should remain Jewish and some accommodation in order should be made in order to make the state home also for the Palestinian citizens as well. Um, I recommend minimal changes to the wording of the anthem, uh, instead of speaking of the Jews, speaking about citizens. Um, and uh, I also recommend that Arabic should be one of the two official languages of the state of Israel. It used to be, but since 2018 is no longer. I think that uh, Arabic should enjoy a dominant status and have the importance it deserves. I think that Arabic should be taught in every primary and high school together with English, because that's the nature of deliberate democracy. You need to have language or a pro in order to communicate. And I think that Hebrew and English should be in every Arab school in Israel. I think the signpost should be written in Hebrew and in Arabic, as it used to be the case, but now less so since the demotion of Arabic. And I, uh, oh, I'm thinking also of adopting official national motto of an Arab uh, proverb, because Arabs and Jews shared the same values of unity, pluralism, peace, tolerance, power, freedom, truth, justice, and righteousness, all of them. So we can find a motto of an Arab and adopt this as, uh, as the motto of the State of Israel. Um, I recommend to do this through a national competition um, to uh, offer such a motto. I recommend the status of all religions that exist in Israel should be made available in every school, and I mean, every religion, including um, Hinduism and, and, and Christianity and Islam, not only Judaism, 
This is the essence of having a multicultural society and egalitarian policies representation in all uh, fragments of government and bureaucracy. And as I said, uh, adding and amending symbols. I'm coming to the last part of my lecture. I'm about to finish. I just want to say a few words about, uh, about the cover. Um, Cambridge University Press allowed me to choose my cover and I agonized myself for some months, what cover should I choose? And um, after deliberation and uh, you know, thinking about many, many choices that were presented before me, I decided on this photo. Uh, this is a photo, if you're not aware, of uh, the walls of old Jerusalem, of ancient Jerusalem from biblical time. And as I told you, I don't believe in walls. I believe in bridges. Jerusalem, of course, is a very multicultural, multicultural city with many religions. Jews, Christians, and Muslims are all living together. So it's a very multicultural community, Jerusalem. And I believe that in order to have the best of all these communities living together and making the best for the state of Israel, we need to break the walls and then we'll be able to see the light. In any event, uh, you're all welcome to visit Jerusalem I think one of the most moving um, pictures that you can ever witness in your life is to see the walls of Jerusalem during dusk. It's simply immensely beautiful. I, for one, always shiver when I have the opportunity to witness this scene, say at about five, six, seven o'clock in the evening when the night comes in and, and the city is illuminated. It's really beautiful. I dedicate a book to three people that uh, made major influence on my studies on multiculturalism. The first is Yudai Alkana, who is no longer with us. But Yudai, I mentioned that I've been doing this research since the 1990s. He was the president of the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute at that time. And you'd heard that I uh, returned to Israel. I was studying at Oxford and uh, spent the last four years before at, in England. He heard that I'm coming back to Israel. He opened uh, the Valier gates for me. He put me in the red card and the red carpet, and he allowed me to engage on with the study of multiculturalism. So actually, when I started my journey, was at the Valier. So for this, I'm telling that to him. The second person is Biko Parekh, who some of you might know. He's a very well-known uh, Indian British scholar, and today also a member of the House of Lords. Uh, Biko is one of the authorities on multiculturalism in the world. He's a good friend, and he read my manuscript before publication from start to finish and uh, made major contributions to make the book better. And for this, I'm eternally uh, grateful to him. And the last one is Will Kimlicka. Will studied at Oxford just before me finished. And Will, um, Will's scholarship uh, um, shaped a lot of my thinking. When I studied at Oxford uh, during the 1980s, early 90s, the major people who, who, who taught there, and you may might know some of them, like Ronnie Dworkin, Ronald Dworkin, and uh, uh, um, uh, Chris McCredden, and uh, Jerry Cohen, um, and Hart, and others, they paid very little homage to culture. Actually, I can't recall that there are many discussion about culture. And I think this was this is wrong. And when I read Will Kimlicka's first book, uh, this for me was very illuminating because Will also tries to reconcile between liberalism and multiculturalism. And a lot of my um, intellectual development is all to him. During my journey of the study of multiculturalism, Will and I co-authored several articles. And again, I'm indebted to him for his contributions to my research. I thank you very much. Thank you, Professor uh, Almagor, uh, for a wonderful lecture. And uh, uh, in fact, it's uh, I would uh, appreciate uh, the uh, kindness of the book. I mean, uh, what's happening in Europe uh, in terms of uh, uh, the conflict uh, uh, that refugee crisis has brought. Uh, and the kind of contradictions that one could see uh, in Germany, in Britain, in France, in the kind of uh, phobia for immigrant communities. Uh, and I mean, uh, 
lot of people would say that Europe uh, is again, you know, have risen uh, to some sort of Islamophobia uh, and the, the contradictions. I mean, you, you were absolutely right in mentioning because as undergraduate students, we used to read uh, Bill Kimrika's first book, Liberalism, Community and Culture. And that was one of the first books that introduced us to, to, to uh, thinking on multiculturalism. We used to read Joseph Kerens, another Canadian uh, uh, political scientist who writes a lot about multiculturalism. Biko Parekh in, uh, in Britain, uh, talking about accommodation of linguistic communities. And uh, so, well, all these questions are very difficult questions. And uh, I mean, the book uh, tries to you know, uh, look at some of the difficult questions which, which one grapples when, we, one, when one thinks about issues of multiculturalism and how multiculturalism can be, you know, be accommodated within a liberal democratic framework. So uh, the, I think the high point of the book is thinking about the, the theories uh, you know, around coercion. You know, under what circumstances, because you have been very, uh, very sympathetic to minoritarian cultures to an extent uh, you know, um, that you formulated uh, this whole idea of self-inflicting pain, not as a barbaric you know, sign of certain communities, but you know, to sort of reconcile uh, uh, the deepest regards for minoritarian culture. Yet, I mean, I would wonder how it, this, uh, regard for minoritarian culture will fit into the theoretical formulation that you use. I mean, using Mill's conceptions of self-regarding uh, action and other regarding uh, action, because uh, I do understand uh, the, the contradiction uh, when uh, one speaks of liberal societies and illiberal societies. And illiberal societies are those societies which exist outside Europe. And this, this was part of the problem within uh, Rawls's text on laws of people. And this was part of the problem which communitarians like Sandel and Walger talked about when they were trying to talk about conceptions of justice. So my first question particularly would be to say that how can we accommodate the deepest regards to the minoritarian cultures, thinking of the self-transformation within the community and then thinking about the positions of power through which the definitions of self and other would come from. You know, so West identifying itself and uh, thinking of liberalism as something which is, which is homegrown. You know? So one, uh, I mean, in India, we, uh, there, there is still a debate in talking about Indian kind of liberalism. You know? So they would, you would find scholars writing on Indian liberalism. But uh, when we see this, I mean, we see this kind of contradiction that if we have to have a definition of, for example, and this is a theoretical question which we, with which we struggle, that how do we theorize group rights in India? You now you would find Professor Nida Chandok's book on secularism. She would talk about Professor Rupit Mahajan Jainu would write about identities and multiculturalism and those issues. So th this, is, this, this has been also sort of uh, uh, a dilemma for Indian liberals to think through the questions of multiculturalism. You no. Know? And I remember one of the textbooks uh, uh, written uh, by Katrina McKinnon on political theory, which now one teaches at undergraduate uh, uh, courses here in political science. There's a book, there's a chapter on multiculturalism in India by Monica Mukherjee. No, but you find lesser number of articles when one wants to use multiculturalism in India. So, so what, I, what I intend to, I mean, uh, I hope I make sense in terms of thinking about this, all these theoretical formulations of culture on which these conceptions of group rights, individual rights, and coercion, what is the framework? Is the framework coming from a mill? And is the framework is sensitive to the dimensions of power while or the act of theorizing these concepts? Yeah. Thank you, Kunal. You made many, many points. I'll, I'll try to address some of them to the best of my abilities. So first of all, you're absolutely right. There is a rise of Islamophobia in Europe. There's also a rise uh, of anti-Semitism in Europe. And of course, we all have to be very, very cautious about these things because we know that uh, Europe is the most bloody continent ever. Um, so Europe has proved itself uh, to be um, very unfriendly and very atrocious uh, continent uh, for minorities, 
And now that we see the rise of immigration as a result of the crisis in the Middle East, crises in plural in the Middle East, as more, more and more immigrants come to Europe as, as a place of refuge because you know, their lives are on the line, literally their lives on the line. Uh, then uh, the result is unfortunately rise in Islamophobia and uh, anti-Semitism. So should, we, should, we should be very cautious and alert about these things and ensure that they're not going to be translated uh, to actions. Uh, right now, the words are very worrying, uh, but uh, um, luckily for us, uh, we, we don't see a lot of blood that has been shed. Enough has been shed. Uh, but uh, it can be far worse, and we have to be far alert uh, to make sure that it doesn't, and to warn against this. Liberalism, Community and Culture of Will Kimlicka is a wonderful, wonderful book, and I I'm very happy that you teach this book. I actually think this is Kimlicka's best book. That's my opinion. Um, I have to say that I first read it in the format of his uh, DPhil dissertation. Uh, because I, I, I went to the Bodleian Library and, and took his dissertation that he submitted to Oxford and read it. And upon the dissertation, he later you know, uh, op did his book. So he developed the dissertation into a book. Um, so it is a wonderful uh, book to still to study. And I think that much of it is still very, very relevant, although I think it was published in 1989 or something like that. But I think that it's, it's a wonderful book. Uh, um, for your information, Biko Park is now in India. Uh, so you may um, invite him to come from Baroda, he's in Baroda, um, to, to give a lecture about multiculturalism in India. If you want during your, during your festival, education festival, uh, he is far more of authority than me to comment on multiculturalism in India. I'm sorry to say that's not part of my research. And one of the rules in my life is never to speak about things I don't understand or, don't, or know little about. So I can't comment about multiculturalism in India, I'm sorry. But I think that Biko would be a wonderful uh, person for you to entertain and to speak about this if you so, or, or so wish. Now, on the question of self-harm, um, listening to you, I think that you know something about political theory, and it seems to me that you probably read John Stuart Mill. So you may recall in On Liberty, uh, Mill um, gives the example of the unsafe bridge. And uh, the example of the unsafe bridge says the following, suppose that in your own community, there is a, a bridge that nobody crosses because everyone knows it's unsafe. You know, it's been there for donkey years and you, you might risk your clothes, your watch, your shoes, maybe your life, if you try to cross that bridge. And supposedly that uh, you, you, you go for a walk with your dog, with your friend, and you see a stranger that is attempting to cross the bridge. And you rush to that person and says, uh, sorry, I want to warn you, this is unsafe bridge. So you are risking yourself by trying to cross it. If the gentleman says to you, thank you very much, and you go back, then he listens to you and everything is fine. But if the gentleman says, thank you very much, but I aim to continue despite your warning, if you read John Stuart Mill, you know that he says, well, that's his choice. Um, so, there's no penalty um, on people who try to take their own lives in most countries in the world, especially in democracies. We think they suffer enough than for us to impose on them some sort of uh, penalty if they, they try to take their lives. We don't do that. So infliction of self-harm is very different from infliction of harm on, on others. And that's a liberal motto that I subscribe to and I believe in. So I think that we need to, to allow this kind of latitude to people. Of course, we need to mitigate against this. We want to make sure that people thrive. I mean, society that encourages suicide is a suicidal. I mean, it's going to be empty. If you if be successful, there's nobody there. So uh, this will be you know, self-defeating. So of course, we should not promote again uh, suicide. We should fight against this. I, for one, now I'm campaigning. I'm, I'm, I authored an article that we publish soon against uh, websites that egg suicide, that promote suicide and push people to suicide. I'm very much against this. I think this is wrong. And there is evidence to show that some people, after they've been um, um, observant of this website and participant in this website, took their own lives and think this is absolutely wrong. So I'll fight against this. 
but will not penalize people who attempt to take their lives. Um, with regard to minorities, I think that we need to allow minorities uh, to develop themselves. I want them to empower themselves. I want to provide them with the tools to empower themselves. And as I said in my lecture, I'm a great believer of education. So whenever the community wants to deny education, either to children or to women, I would be the first to oppose this. And I would say, no, you, you cannot do that. Uh, we are all operating with certain framework, which is called the state and the country, and you have to subscribe to a certain curriculum that is provided by the state that is aimed to empower ourselves. Uh, when there, was a, there were occasions of uh, Jewish Orthodox schools in London that did not subscribe to the English curriculum and they insisted not to teach English in the schools because they speak Yiddish there. We're talking about old um, tradition, Orthodox Jewish tradition of Eastern Europe uh, that spoke Yiddish and, and they taught in, in Yiddish and not in English. I would be the first to say that England should interfere because the people who are going to be graduate from this school are going to suffer forever. Now, if you want to continue in your closed community, never to go out and never integrate into society, fine. But I would assume that this is not going to be good for all people in that community. And at some point of their life, they would like to go and be part of the Danish community. And then the state has to provide them with the tools to self-empowerment. So I am all for self-empowerment aligned in the minority. And of course, I'm saying the most complicated question to answer is the, um, the scope of interference. It's really difficult. I try to provide the tools via my theory and then the application that showed how the theory can be manifested into real case studies. I try my best to provide my readers with enough tool to make the judgment call. Um, it might not be perfect, but at least I made a very sincere attempt. I do agree with you, uh, but one thing which I which comes across my mind, I mean, uh, is that when we still talk about liberal and illiberal societies, I think illiberalism ha was had an intimate uh, relationship with the history of liberalism itself. I think Uday Singh Mehta has talked about that thing more clearly, at least in Locke and other thinkers, Edmund Burke and other liberalism and the empire. So yeah. this distinction, I mean, um, and this is something, this is an open-ended question, even in Rawls. And I mentioned a uh, loss of people who's a revision on a theory of justice. So I think that that question still holds its ground in terms of which societies we call illiberal societies and what are the no normative assumptions? Because the same, uh, 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 the, the definition of illiberal societies also comes from liberalism. You no, know? that these are societies which are illiberal societies. So the, 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 these are, the, so when you speak of in terms of subcultures, I still say illiberalism, uh, I mean, it's, it's like a question, no, provincializing Europe kind of question that, no, what Europe thinks about illiberalism is, is in the standards it can put uh, its own society or Britain, then they would find that, no, there is a, there is, a, it's part of their own history. I mean, so that sort of. Uh, there, there are many definitions of liberalism. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and of course, uh, liberals allow to a certain extent, illiberal views within liberalism, within liberal society. The, the question is when there is harm that uh, liberalism cannot no, no, no longer tolerate. And I said the book provides some contribution to this discussion, this, this debate. But I would say that there are possibly four common features of liberalism uh, that run through, I think, vast uh, array of interpretations of liberalism. And these are the following. First of all, and the rule of law. So you have to abide the law of the state as long as you feel that it's just and reasonable. If you feel it's not just and reasonable, then you can at least have the opportunity to um, protest against this, to gather enough people around you and maybe to drive for a change. And this is happening all the time. In Professor Albagor, I will just interrupt. I mean, uh, one of my students is pushing me to ask this question to you. So I, I'll just uh, ask this question and you can answer it uh, if you'd like. Uh, so Sanskriti Shemali, one of the students says, India is a land of various cultures. Having said that there are two groups in every religion, extremists and modern thinkers. I recently, uh, there are trends that explain that the extremist through the blanket of liberalism is trying to impose uh, impose their religious fundamentalism through various practices. How should one deal with it? 
that's a student's question. Oppose problems, it. problems of religious extremism. Yeah. No, you need to oppose religious extremism yeah. and you need to uh, promote the ideas of the rule of law, of basic human rights, of respect for others and of not harming others. And if you have religious extremism that want to harm others in the name of religion, then of course you should oppose this. So um, it, it, it really depends what kind of coercion, coercion you, want to, uh, you want to impose. Uh, but I, for one, when I speak about coercion, it's only in order to promote human rights, respect for others, and not harming others. Certainly not just to promote the welfare or the um, conception of the good of, of few over the many. Um, I think that should be all these things when you have conflicting opinions should be reconciled and debated in a free um, atmosphere um, and do this through the means of compromise and deliberate, deliberate democracy. Thank you, Professor Almagor. It's always uh, illuminating to have to, to have a discussion with you, I get to learn many things. I mean, liberalism is one such doctrine which, which competes within itself and its various histories and various strands. So wonderful to hear you on uh, a very uh, timely uh, uh, book and a timely topic. Uh, and thank you so much. So on behalf of Institute of Law, uh, I thank you for your time and this wonderful lecture that you have given to us. We have learned a lot from you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye bye. Digandai, we can end the meeting. How do I connect uh, to the